Genesis chapter 8. Well, the friends that we choose for ourselves have a huge impact on our lives for good or for ill. As a parent, you might have despaired to see the friends that your child had chosen as you stand by helpless, waiting for the fallout. Or you may have been delighted in the formation of a lifetime bond with someone who helps your child to be the best person that they can be. But the people that we surround ourselves with are really, really important. And it's a pity that Judah couldn't see it. Now, in our chapter of Genesis today, we have around 22 years of Judah's life. It's kind of concertinaed into two sections. Verses 1 to 11 cover 21 years or thereabouts. And verses 12 to 30, just one very eventful year. And it's also a bit of a surprise to be following Judah because in the last chapter we were looking at Joseph's life. Now we'll pick Joseph back up next time but the author is deliberately laying the two stories side by side, the two people Joseph and Judah side by side as potential future leaders both of the family and of the nation. Which one of the two will be God's choice? And of course, neither looks particularly great, do they? You've got Joseph, the bratty telltale, and Judah, the callous slave trader. But both of them will change over the next few decades as God shapes them through their experiences. So let's look at Judah. Now, the first two verses should sound a warning bell for anyone who's been following the story so far. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Shua, who married her and made love to her. So it seems that Judah has got a new best friend, Hira, and this new best friend isn't one of God's people. In fact, the friendship moves him away from the land that God has given so far and away from God's people. He's not just moving down geographically, but spiritually as well. And then, of course, because he's not with his own people, he finds a woman not of his people and he marries her. Now, even if we didn't know the rest of the chapter, we could guess that this isn't going to end well. Well, she has three sons, Ur, Onan and Sheila. But they don't grow up to be fine, upstanding men. In fact, the first one is so evil that God puts him to death. Now, it must have been really evil because we've had some unpleasant types in the story so far, and God has let them live. But not Ur. He must have been wicked through and through. And his brother Onan, he's not much better, is he? Judah wants Onan to do the right thing by his brother, according to the rules of the time. And to sleep with Ur's wife, Tamar, to give her and his brother children. But while Onan is happy to sleep with Tamar, he does all he can not to have children by her. Now, while this passage is often used to show that God doesn't approve of contraception, actually that's not what's going on here. The issue is far more complicated. It's a story of greed, power, and lust. Because the wealth and the power, the birthright in the family, passed down from the father to the eldest son. Did you notice the repetition as we read the passage about Ur being the firstborn? If he's the firstborn, he's got the birthright. Now when he died, that birthright 
passed on to his brother Onan. But if Onan gives Ur's wife children, it would all pass to that child, that son. So he didn't want to do it. He wanted to keep all of that power and all of that potential wealth for himself. But rather than say, no, I'm not having anything to do with it, he says, fine, I'll sleep with her. And he takes the pleasure deceitfully. And it's this greed and this deception that God finds a bond. And so he gets rid of Onan as well. Now, of course, this leaves Tamar without a husband and Judah is getting just a little bit twitchy. Why were his sons dying? Was it because of Tamar? Was she doing something to him? Couldn't possibly be his fault for raising them to be wicked, to not reign in their wickedness. Couldn't possibly be their fault for their bad behaviour. Oh no, it must have been Tamar, blame the woman. So Judah engages in his own bit of deception. He'll pretend that Tamar can marry Sheila, the remaining son, but he won't go through with it. Verse 11. Live as a widow in your father's household until my son Sheila grows up. For he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. And Tamar obeys and goes back to her father's house. And all of this takes around 21 years, while Joseph, Judah's brother, is in Egypt. But it all comes to a head the next year. Verse 12. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah, to the men who were shearing his sheep. And his friend, Hira, the Adullamite, went with him. So there's his pal, Hira, again. It seems that where Hira is, trouble follows. And it's party time, the time of shearing the sheep. And Judah and Hira pop along for the party. It's also the time when the men would visit the pagan fertility shrines to ask for blessings on their crops and their animals for the year. Now, of course, Judah should have absolutely nothing to do with it. But he's thrown his lot in with Hira and the pagans. So off he goes. It seems as if he has given up on everything his great-grandfather Abraham stood for. Now, Judah might be a faithless sellout, but Tamar isn't. Even though she's a local girl, she's obedient. Now, we've already seen that by the way she goes back to her father's house when she's told to. But in verse 14, we see that she is still wearing the widow's clothes. But time has passed and she's still not been given in marriage to Sheila, though he is plenty old enough. And the way things are going there will be no grandchildren for Judah and the line will die out. So she takes matters into her own hands. And to properly understand what's going on, we need to know the ancient laws of the area because they give a specific course of events if a married man should die and his brother's also die or be unable to marry her. You see, in that situation, the man's father was expected to take the widow as his wife in order to produce sons for the son who died. Now, of course, God's law won't go as far as this, but it hasn't been given yet. And there's enough evidence to say that this was the accepted practice of the time. And Judah, of course, hasn't followed it. And so Tamar dresses up as a shrine prostitute and waits for Judah to arrive. He does, and providentially he sees her there and he wants to sleep with her. Now, of course, he doesn't know that it's her because of the veil 
that she's wearing over her face. And I wonder if that reminds you of anything earlier in the story. Wasn't Leah's identity hidden on her wedding day by the veil that was over her face, hidden in order to pass her off as her sister? Anyway, Judah is honourable in the sense that he offers her a young goat in payment, but he hadn't thought to bring one along. So as a pledge that he will pay, Tamar asks for his seal and cord and his staff. Now, these were highly personal objects. A seal was a, a cylinder, a small cylinder that men wore round their neck. And it had a unique design, which could be rolled onto clay to make an imprint as a signature or a personal mark. And the staff too would have unique carvings on it. It would be no light matter to hand them over. It'd be like leaving your passport or your driver's license with someone. But Judah leaves them and gets down to business with Tamar, who keeps her veil over her face. The deed done, Judah leaves and Tamar changes back into her widow's clothes and goes back home again. So when Judah's friend Hira tries to find her to give her the goat, well, she's nowhere to be seen. And nobody knows of a shrine prostitute beside the road at Enaim anyway. So Judah decides to cut his losses and leave it there because it would be embarrassing to pursue it any further. But of course, that's not the end of the story. Three months later, and Tamar is clearly pregnant. Judah rather hypocritically wants to kill her for being a prostitute, but as she's being taken for punishment, she reveals the identity of the child's father. It's none other than Judah himself, proven by the cord and the seal and the staff. And at this point, he makes a staggering realisation. Verse 26, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son, Sheila. Suddenly, he sees the way that is behaved and is repentant. Now we don't hear him say the words but his actions show what's going on in his heart. He doesn't sleep with her again and from this point he begins to change. And strange as it seems to our ears, God blesses Tamar for what she did. She gives birth not to one child but to two and like with Jacob and Esau, there is a wrestling between those two sons and the younger one comes out on top. And Perez will be the one who becomes the ancestor of David and ultimately Jesus. And if we're still not sure about Tamar, we have to see what the rest of scripture says about her. And lo and behold, she's mentioned in the book of Ruth, chapter four, verse 12, in the blessing that Boaz is given by the people, the elders of Bethlehem. May your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. And she also gets a mention in Jesus's genealogy, Matthew chapter one, verse three. And in fact, there are 10 generations from Perez to David, a symbolic number of completeness. And so though Tamar's actions seem strange to us, at that time and in that context, she was the one who acted in faith to, put, to preserve the family line, the line of God's promise. So what about Judah then? Well, he's got in with a bad crowd. He's thrown aside the faith of his youth to indulge in a fertility cult. He's not kept his promises and the consequences have been two dead sons 
and a daughter-in-law driven to desperate measures. Surely it should be the end for Judah. Well, it isn't because repentance is possible for him. When he's brought up short, he realises it and God begins to change him. I wonder if we allow the same space for others to change. You know, today people are vilified for things they put on a decade ago or when they were teenagers. As if people can't change, as if people can't realise the error of their ways and make a difference. But God doesn't see things that way. If we're willing to repent, he will work in us and shape us for the future. And if there is hope for Judah, well, there's hope for us and there's hope for those around us. So a potentially confusing bit of Genesis this morning, but one with such a message of hope for the future. If God could turn a callous, idol-worshipping, promiscuous slave trader into the leader of his family and the nation, then anyone can have their lives turned round by God. No one is so bad that if they won't that when they repent that God won't change their lives forever. So shouldn't we show that forgiveness and give that space to others to change? Well, a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you took Judah and you changed him. You shaped him from the inside out and turned him into the man who would be the leader of his family and his nation. We thank you for the way, loving Father, you do change lives. We thank you for the way that you have changed ours. And we pray that you would continue to do that shaping work by your Holy Spirit. And help us, we pray, to allow others that space and that grace to change as well. Thank you, loving Father, that you don't just cast us aside. If we're willing to repent, you come with all your love and all your power. In Jesus' name, Amen.